My name is Nadia Behchet Abbas. Um, I am doing a PhD in theoretical physics at Queen Mary. I'm in the second year. I've just completed one year. And um, I'm a mature student. OK, so this is um, coming from uh, a need, I guess, to bridge two very different parts of physics. So we have um, one category of theories that covers the very, very small, so particles and their interactions. We have another um, way of describing very massive um, objects under the force of gravity. And if you try to merge these theories, they don't really merge very well together. Well, we want to um, merge these theories for the very small and the very large um, for a couple of reasons. So one is that there are phenomena that require both descriptions. So for example, black holes could be seen as very, very small and could be described by some uh, particle theory, or you would want to describe them by, by some particle theory. Um, but on the other hand, they're very massive, and um, so we would want to describe them by, um, by some, some kind of gravitational model as well. So you need to have both descriptions there, and. Um, so just from, from that perspective, you, you need to have uh, some, some successful merger of the two theories. OK, so you have various theories that um, try to uh, merge these theories um, really by proposing some alternative overarching theory. Um, I'm not an expert in any of them, but okay, string theory is one example of, of such a theory. Um, the double copy is a bit different. So um, in the part of the double copy that I'm studying, um, I'm trying to look for some correspondence between the, the theories that are already well grounded in nature. We look for some mathematical objects, for example, um, amplitudes which are related to the probability of seeing some interactions. And we find that under certain conditions and under certain restrictions, the amplitudes of gravity can look like the amplitudes of those related to particles. And that is the double copy. So this is a tool to learn more about nature. And if we learn more about nature, then it could maybe, um, well, not exactly give hints to what could be um, a unifying theory or anything like that. I, I would just say that we're gathering data that could help us if we want to go down the road of looking for some kind of unification. Just the fact that it is so surprising to see this correspondence tells us that we, we think we know everything there is about, about these, um, these well-established theories. But actually, no, there's, there's still more that can be unearthed. Um, I did my first degree ages ago, as I'm a mature student. Um, that was in mathematics at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, I really enjoyed um, mathematics, but I found toward the end of my degree, when it was a little bit too late, that what I enjoyed much more was actually physics. Um, so I vowed that one day I would return to the subject. Um, after finishing my degree, I moved to London 
and more or less I found my way working into finance, working in finance. Um, I did that for a while, quite a long while, and I can't say that I disliked it. I did enjoy it and I did get a lot out of it, but I knew that one day I wanted to come back to academia and really give physics a proper go. A few years ago, okay, maybe a little bit more than a few years ago, um, I had the chance to move to Malaysia. This was because my husband was relocated for, um, for a job. While I was there, I felt that I did not want to be isolated, um, just a hermit in, in, my, uh, in my room with, with a pile of books. But I wanted to be part of the world and live in the world and be part of a community and also to help other people. Um, so I decided to, uh, to volunteer my time teaching at a school for refugees uh, from Myanmar. So I was teaching teenage kids of various backgrounds um, mathematics. Yeah, this is the challenge because a lot of them were coming from um, from backgrounds with varying levels of education. They were varying ages, 12 to 17. Some of them had long gaps um, in their education. Um, some of them had faced some trauma, um, which is why they were fleeing the country. And that was the first rule that, or the first, um, not the first rule, the first lesson that I learned, really, that before you can start giving an elegant algorithm for solving a problem, you first have to make sure that you've got someone there that is receptive to learning. And so you've got to get them comfortable. You've got to, you've got to um, take into account that they're human and give them permission to be human. And, um, try to calm any fears, try to make them feel good, try to give them some confidence and make them feel happy to be there and laugh together and, and get them to learn. So that's step one. And then you have to overcome the language barrier. So I had to be quite creative with how I was teaching various concepts in mathematics and I tried to make things physical um, in many cases, so I tried to teach them algebra using um, cups and beans and buttons and things like that rather than equations on the board. And um, actually I found that, that that works pretty well even with fluent English speakers, that that is the better way. <laughs> um, it seems to, to get through to, to people more, more easily than symbols on a board.